So Josh, you you start you worked with Natalie Cole at some point, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah. And I know that you're on you're on Unforgettable and Stardust and I'm on yeah, I'm I'm on some of the tracks on Unforgettable, including right. the Unforgettable track. And that was boy, that was something to be sitting there and not knowing what it was and right. then hear Nat Cole's voice in our phones when we started to rehearse. Oh my God, Mike. I mean, it was, I had that experience just being a touring guy with her, but I was right. wondering what you felt in that moment that you first did that. <laughs> you know, I because, was like, yeah. uh, wow. You know, and it, it was such a magical date. I remember um, Johnny Medell was involved. Tommy um, uh, LaPuma was one of the producers. I think Al Schmidt recorded it. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Ray Brown played on that. Ray and, Brown played uh, on it. That's and right. Tommy Guerin, I think, played on that track. Yeah. Oh, God. I also, I remember uh, have, Johnny Mandel didn't get any awards as a conductor. He was a real space cadet. And um, I had <laughs> this ad lib intro that he'd written on Lush Life in some horrendous key. B. And, is that what it was? I played it in B, and I'm like, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> and I had to follow this kind of like, whatever it was <laughs> <laughs> and, oh and i had to watch him at a mirror because i they didn't have me facing him live into the room i was in an iso booth oh so there was a lot of kind of, of unusual things that went on but i was but one of my dearest friends is terry trotter who played with natalie probably before you played with Natalie. that's right i came in after terry yeah and um who so I'm a huge fan of, and oh, I just who, who isn't? My I know he's so brilliant, and I love his records too with La Barbara and uh -huh. um, what's yeah, his name? Was it Bob Magnuson? No, no, it was um, who oh, plays with Clay Tom, Jenkins and a lot who moved to New Zealand. Oh, Tom Warrington. Tom Warrington. Right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. he did all his uh, records of different songwriters. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, Terry and I met when we were in our twenties, probably. And also Charlie Shoemaker, we were all friends, the three of us together for many, many years. And uh, I haven't talked to Charlie in a long time, but Terry and I talk quite Good. often. Yeah. Oh yeah, I basically learned how to play Natalie's book from the recordings Terry. of the shows of, yeah. of Terry playing. Yeah. Have you? Did you ever get to meet him or spend time with him? Yeah, I spent a little time with Terry. Uh -huh. I had a lesson uh, when I was a teenager with him okay. because my, my teacher, Jan Roper, uh, she said, you got to get a lesson with Terry. Uh, he's just, there's no one like him. So I, I had one lesson. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. I'll I've never, never had a lesson from him. Oh, that would be fun to do. It was mm -hmm. nice. Yeah. yeah. He's very, well, he's a very opinionated man. So <laughs> oh, yeah. talk to him. he likes to spar a lot. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, we're, uh, we're live and we have uh, a bunch of people already chiming in. So, uh, Welcome, everybody, to uh, another West Coast Jazz Hour episode. Uh, Josh, are we at 46, 47? 48. 48. Oh wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. I, I know. Time, time flies. In, in about a week or so, we're on our uh, second anniversary of, of doing this, so it's, it's pretty incredible. How, uh, how, you do this like once a week, or how often do you do them? Or is it that structured? Or we started out doing it once a week when nobody was doing anything two years right. ago in the middle yeah. of the pandemic and now we're doing it about once maybe twice a month depending on what our schedules uh, will allow us to do sure uh, but but we did uh, um, we did one with Nick Mancini at the beginning of this month oh. vibraphone player sure. you know, He's yeah and uh, now, now you at this uh, at the end of this month, and then for next month we have uh, Terry Gibbs actually coming back for the second time. Oh, that's great! Yeah, because uh, he's been asking when when am I coming back? And mm -hmm. now he's ninety seven, and at the at the end of uh, May, the LA Jazz Institute is going to throw this festival in honor of him, and oh, he just nice. he just uh, reissued a, a new. It's a, an old new record, but it's reissued from vinyl onto the digital streaming services, uh, mm -hmm. which I was happy to write the liner notes actually oh, for. Nice. So that that's cool also to kind of present that uh, music. So yeah, in the beginning of the pandemic, we did it once a week, and now it's about once a month. Uh, but still, it's super fun. 
Yeah, it was just flashing on the fact that you said that he's coming back to do another show and thinking of his line to me about I'm making a comeback. So he's making yeah. a comeback with you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, we're at uh, number 48 of the West Coast Jazz Hour. We're so happy that uh, all of you guys are, uh, are joining us for today. Um, a little introduction of the gentleman who we have today, and we're very happy to have him once again uh, on the show because he was part of our tribute episode for uh, Larry Bunker together with Chuck Berghofer and Jeff Hamilton. And a little bit of trivia about this uh, gentleman, uh, which you can find on uh, Wikipedia or Discogs.com, that he holds a Bachelor of Music uh, from the University of Michigan and then in addition has studied with Leonard Steen and Ch for piano and George Tremblay for composition. But let me then, just, I'm sorry to jump in. It's Leonard. No, Stein. go right ahead. Leonard Stein. Oh, Leonard Stein. I don't want to come back from the dead and, you know, kill my first. <laughs> <laughs> I stand corrected. That's Leonard it. Stein and George Tremblay. And then uh, when he came here to L.A., he studied with Pearl Kaufman and the great Lalo Schifrin. Uh, he is on over 2000 film scores and has played with uh, artists such as Ray Charles, Natalie Cole, Ella Fitzgerald, Aretha Franklin, uh, Frank Zappa, Mill Jackson, Lee Konitz, Diana Krall. Uh, the film composers are uh, including John Williams, Jerry Goldsmith, James Newton Howard, Henry Mancini, Elmer Bernstein. Oof. The list goes on and on with uh, who this gentleman has worked with. So today we're very lucky in welcoming welcoming uh, Mike Lang to our show. Welcome, Mike. Thank Hi. you for being here. Thank and, you. Yeah, and uh, we'll, we we talked uh, already a little uh, a little bit about, you know, uh, about some experiences that uh, that you've had. And uh, the, the first question that we always uh, ask to our guest is, uh, when and why did you move uh, to LA back in the day? And who were some of the first musicians that you started to play with? You, you asked me when and why did I move to L.A.? Yeah. Well, I was born here, so it was... Yeah. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I missed that little piece of trivia. I was trying to figure out where where you're from. So you're from here. Yeah, I, I am from here. And, and one thing I will tell you that I'll just say this to put it out there because you can see where I'm living and my music room and all that. Um, it's a long story, but the bottom line is that uh, I was born in Studio City. And my parents lived there for four and a half years, and then we moved to Westwood. And uh, uh, my wife, Karen, and I were looking for a house about, I don't know, 40 some years ago. And we accidentally stumbled onto the property, unknowingly, which was the property that I had lived in. And the property was owned by a, a composer, pianist named George Greeley. And uh, in a conversation with George Greeley and Karen, it was established that my father built the house that we were looking at and that I had lived there. And even though this room is an addition, I'm, I'm living in the house that, that, that I was born in. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> oh, that's incredible. So we really got to my birthplace, literally. Yeah. Kind of the hospital, but close, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, that's amazing. amazing. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, well, I mean, we can go right in, uh, ahead into uh, some uh, some music and stuff. Who were who were some of the uh, first musicians that you started to work with when you transitioned into the professional uh, the professional scene out here? Well, I went to the University of Michigan, and when I graduated, I came back, and I um, was on active duty with the Army for six months as part of a reserve program. Um, I graduated in June of sixty three. I was in the army the first half of 64. And then I started trying to figure out what I thought I was gonna be doing. And um, there were two things that I thought I wanted to learn more about. One was what it would be like having a career in jazz and performing and all of that, traveling, recording. And then the other was I had heard about this freelance kind of world of recording. People were hired as musicians to play on film scores and television scores and work with recording artists and different styles of music. And um, at the time, as, as I started to work with various people, uh, most of the people I were work, was working with 
um, doing the most interesting work were jazz musicians who were hiring me. So I was playing with people like Teddy Edwards and um, I actually sat in with Dexter Gordon. He had me to go on the road, but we couldn't work out a deal. So we didn't go on the road with Dexter Gordon. And um, I'm trying to think of who else. Warren Marsh was someone I worked with a lot and Bud Shank and, you know, just a lot of the work, Jack Sheldon, a lot of the people we hear gigging. And um, when I joined Paul Horn's band, we did a tour that went by station wagon all the way back east and back here and it was a pretty rough trip you know driving all the time and uh we drove straight without stopping so we were sleeping in the car and spelling each other and um i think what i walked away with from that was that i didn't think i wanted to be doing that as a lifestyle you know um uh i was someone who my life has always been about being in a relationship with somebody and so traveling is not maybe as appealing for someone who's got a family life and um the idea of studio recording to me it seemed like it was maybe solider and the uh um in a way challenging in ways that i wouldn't have just working with one band playing the same music every night so it just and it just kind of happened you know i mean if I were one of those guys that Miles Davis asked to join his band, who knows what may or may not have happened if I had, you know, one of those kind of opportunities. Um, but um, slowly but surely, I started uh, being asked to work on recording projects. And um, and that's where it kind of went. And But I continued to work a lot in Los Angeles, playing with jazz musicians and local clubs and stuff. And it was a big part of my life and still an important part of my life. Yeah, awesome. Um, hold on, I'm having some uh, screen issues over here. Oh. Uh, ah, I'm back. Okay. Um, yeah, well, thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, I have a, a, a record right here. This is your first recorded record on uh, your discography, um, which is arranged by by uh, Lalo, arranged and conducted by Lalo Schifrin. Produced by Al Schmidt, Jazz Suite on the Mass Text. Yeah, I should and, interrupt you to tell you the most important part is it was composed by Lalo Schifrin. That's yeah. an original extended work for chorus and jazz quintet and orchestra. So wow. it's really like a classical piece of music. Yeah, and it's a yeah. super it's a super nice recording. Paul is playing flute, alto and bass flute and alto sax. Uh, uh, then it's Lynn Blessing on vibes, Bill Plummer on bass, uh, yours truly, uh, uh, or um, Mike Lang on piano, you, <laughs> and Larry Bunker on uh, on drums, and then uh, a who's who of uh, of uh, musicians: Vincent De Rosa on French horn, Frank Rosalino on trombone, Dick uh, Leith on bass trombone, Al Presino and Conti Condoli, Red Calendar. Uh, Dorothy wow. Remsen and Ann Stockton on harp, and then Ken Watson, Emil Richards, Frank, Frank Flynn, and Milt Holland uh, taking care of all of the percussion. So this is an incredible, this is an incredible recording for sure. Amazing. So it's it's a it's a good recording to have as your first recording. <laughs> it, was, it was just a gift from the gods, you know, and it, it was not only a, a wonderful, wonderful recording in terms of. <clears throat> The quality of the music and the, and the quality of the players and all of that but it was a very important rec recording it was paul's debut on rca mm -hmm. and it won two grammys which was a big deal and al schmidt produced it and, and, and engineered it so in every way it was a very uh, auspicious opportunity to be the very first record you know it's like everything after that was downhill i, I don't <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You had a very lucky first opportunity. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I've heard that from a bunch of teachers uh, who have uh, uh, very cool experiences early on, and they say I was spoiled for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of that same experience. Um, uh, so you gave me a bunch of uh, audio recordings. Um, is there anything in particular that you like that we should start off with to showcase uh, the people who are watching and listening? I, I think I'd let you pick it. I mean, we, we, we went over the list and they're all, they're all worth hearing, I think, I hope. Cool. And so just, just go for it. 
Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, well, okay. So to start it off properly, uh, there is this uh, session that you did with uh, Art Pepper and Lee Konitz, uh, Bob Magnuson on bass, and John Dents on drums, and yourself uh, on piano. Uh, it was reissued uh, by the estate of uh, Art Pepper as uh, West Coast Sessions Volume 3, I think. And uh, I have the the track High Jingo uh, available here. Is that an original composition by Lee or by Art? Do you remember that by any chance? I just have to look at the album cover to, to okay. do that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it's one of them, you know. Um, the thing that was interesting about, there were several things that were interesting about that recording. Um, Art Pepper was a huge uh, star in Japan. Mm-hmm. And the original record company, Atlas, was a Japanese record company. This was originally issued in Japan. And they wanted Lee, I mean, uh, Art as a recording artist, but he had an exclusive contract with Fantasy Records in the United States. So the way they did it was they did a whole series of recordings with other people listed as the artist and Art Pepper being a featured guest. So this was mm-hmm. one of those. It was issued as a Lee Konitz record. And... Um, and, and, and so, it, but it was really Lee and Art, you know, two saxophones playing together. And, yeah. uh, and, and Art also played uh, clarinet on some of the record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and on this track, you actually play a really nice piano intro. So uh, uh, why don't we take a listen to uh, this track? This is called High Jingo by Art Pepper and Lee Konitz with Mike Lang on piano. Here we go.
Yeah. Nice. Great solo, Mike. Wow. Oh, thank you. You know, it was interesting. I, I do remember very specifically, uh, I don't think it was necessarily intentional, but it kind of happened organically that because Lee Konitz was there, I was immediately thinking about Lenny Tristano, who was a big, big influence on my playing in a very kind of um, hidden way. It wasn't like you'd hear a lot of my playing and immediately think about that. But um, when Lenny Tristano started recording for Atlantic Records, he made two records, which for me were two of the most profound records ever made. And I can't help but reflect that the linearity of that solo is kind of coming from that place. And even the time field to a certain extent in terms of right. how the phrases kind of overlap and stuff. And uh, I think I was looking to to to, to uh, make a connection with Lee Conitz by going in that direction. And I don't recall that he ever said anything about it. So whatever. Yeah. I was going to ask. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I heard I heard the Lenny kind of flavor a little bit in there but it was it obviously intrinsically you it also kind of reminded me a little bit of i'm a big michelle petrucciani fan me too uh, i'm sure you love him too and i i love him to death but i didn't know who he was back then oh back then yeah oh. yeah because this record's from what early 80s 82 or something i would think it's in the 70s oh 70s. yeah yeah I, I may be able to look at or do you have you don't have the record there you just have you wouldn't have that well we'll look it up uh, yeah uh, I, yeah i, mean, I would have i won't to. take the time now but um but I yeah michelle did yeah he had those there's that duo record with lee conan's and i just love them together michelle. i haven't heard that at all oh you'd love it i, yeah. I think it's i, I think it's it. great but, but i i really became very attached to michelle patriciani really in the last few years really became aware of him because mm -hmm. he's so visceral yeah, it's so uh, on target emotionally for me, and I, and it just it just that's how I feel about him too, Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just and I love his writing. Yeah, I me too. Yeah, do what a what, what a loss. I mean, God. and um, anytime you find anything live, he, it's like I keep waiting to find you know him when he's having a slow day, and I can't find it. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's always inspired and always so passionate i know it's true yeah this uh, was from uh, 1982. Hmm. 80, the record is 1982 you said yeah. wow that is yeah. later than i would have thought interesting yeah yeah but every everybody sounds great on it and yeah uh no nobody also talks about uh john dents but the you know the the solo that he took was so musical and so melodical and yeah. you hear that back uh, on uh, Garen playing with the Mike Wofford trio uh, Shelly Mann with Andre Previn it's it's very uh, the, all of the the West Coast drummers are so um, uh, like nobody's paying attention to those guys while they are some of the most musical drummers that I've ever heard in my life. I, I agree with you. And John Dance was extraordinary and underexposed, I think, you know, I think he lived in San Diego, if I'm not mistaken, and mm -hmm. was in and out of LA, but not really glued to LA in the same way that some other people were. Yeah. But I was very thrilled to know that he was there because I knew it would be alive, you know? And, and Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way how to describe that. It's, it's super alive and it's uh, pretty, uh, it also pretty edgy. It's not mm -hmm. not super clean, but you know, uh, edgy has an edge to it. And, and there was a question that popped in my mind also after hearing this because you said Lenny Tristano was an influence to you. But uh, who would you say are your main influence on your piano playing? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. So, uh, who are your main influences on piano besides Lenny Tristano? You know, it's a question that I find hard to answer because it's like if you, you ask me that question 20 different times in my life, you know, I've been <laughs> thinking about different things. It's a cumulative kind of uh, flowing experience. Um, uh, I mean, historically, I can tell you that... Um, the I think the first pianist that I wrapped my head around was Oscar Peterson. Mm. When he did the live at the Shakespeare Festival. Oh, and, and so the, good. And it was <laughs> so on fire. And just, uh, and the will to swing. And I, 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 that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to groove like that. Mm. And so I devoted a whole lot of time going in that direction. And I still relate to it. But then I moved away from that. Then I was listening to people like Bud Powell and Thelonious Monk. 
and uh, and the people who came out of the bebop music, you know, tradition more directly, uh, like in you know, I went to Ann Arbor, so people like Barry Harris and Tommy Flanagan and Cherry Pollard, who's a very underappreciated Tina Pollard, yeah. Gibson worked with, and um, so I was kind of in that world, you know. So people like Bobby Timmons, I was a big fan of. Sure. I like people who were earthy. And, and then also my my ears were going outside of jazz to R&B and to um, certain kinds of rock and roll and gospel playing and stuff like that. So it was coming from everywhere, you know. Mm. I mean, I could say Count Basie or I could say Ray Charles or I could say sure. uh, and people like McCoy China and Herbie Hancock and all those people came later. They all were very significant for me. Uh, Keith Jarrett, you know, Bill Evans. <laughs> Great was... yeah. yeah 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 well i mean you know that's a, a really really great answer that you're you know you were so um uh, ob uh observant of what was happening also around you at the at the time and you know so many different names and so many different tastes and flavors and all of that stuff um so i i take that for for sure um Let's see what we have regarding yeah. the music also. What is good after this? Um, well, uh, something actually, uh, maybe to stay just for one more in, in the, the West Coast vibe, if you will. Uh, or there are actually two that uh, are really nice examples of the, you know, we've had this discussion about, you know, West Coast uh, and, you know, the, the term West Coast and how that was kind of made by the critics. Um, but there's this really nice recording that you made uh, with uh, the Vic Lewis All Stars um, with a big band, which features some of the greatest uh, uh, jazz musicians that we still have also in town, such as Andy Martin, John Clayton, uh, Jeff Hamilton. Um, Jack Sheldon was also on that recording session, if I'm not mistaken. Mike? I, I don't remember. I mean, I wouldn't I, remember that. That's so long. I, I think Jack Sheldon and Conti Condoli are both on this. On yeah, this were, I was on part of the album, as I recall. So there were different, yeah. sessions. probably different people were available. And so it's a little different from session to session. Right, 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 right. Well, you play a, you play a solo on the, the second version of Olio's. Should we play that? Sure, that would be fine. I mean, sure. probably the star of, of, of the record, Vic Lewis was like a band leader, but apart from putting the records out i mean bill holman was the star he was the arranger you know it's yeah like a bill holman record with Rick lewis you know yeah. Rick lewis the all-stars you know yeah he, he showed up and went like this and went home you know? <laughs> <laughs> well the guy can for sure write <laughs> yeah. i mean to, to his credit he recorded a lot of jazz records and and had a really successful run with them you know they were respected and reviewed well and uh and he got all the right people wonderful people to be involved and i was just happy to be part of it yeah yeah got an excited fun. excited pup back there yeah. yeah let me see what i can do about oh that. don't worry oh, about you're, it. you're yeah. fine you're fine okay. yeah, yeah yeah he he, bark, he barks at things that he can't have like squirrels and, and <laughs> he's about this big but he's very nice. nice. Well, I look forward to hearing this. I was not aware of this record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm familiar with this record for several years already because I was so into and still am so into Jeff Hamilton that I right. ran into this uh, this record pretty early on in my undergrad days. But yeah, John uh, Clayton and, and Jeff are the rhythm section. All right. I, I'm going to just take care of this. Okay. You know, <laughs> you'll read about the obituary. Just... <laughs> <laughs> Laying down the law. Yeah, that's well, right. Thanks for let's check in with Deborah? some of the folks here chatting. Deborah? Um, <laughs> Larry Goldings. Larry Goldings is here. Hey, Larry. Oh, hey, Larry. Yeah. What's up, What's up Larry and Liz Finch? Hey, Liz. Thanks for joining Liz is us. Here. Yeah. Gwen Singpeel. Hey, Gwen. How are you? Thanks for joining. We're talking with pianist. Uh, uh just all around great guy musician mike lang and he is dealing with his dog <laughs> right <now. laughs> yeah so we're hanging out and uh 
Hey, oh. Karen, hey, Karen. Hammock is here. Yeah, Karen, Craig for Cochran is here. Welcome back to the stage, Mike Lang. Hey. Longer than I thought to kill the dog, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine. Thanks, Jack Sheldon would say. The world's greatest piano player, Mike Lang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even I cheer up at the name. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I yeah, know. Yeah. Who? Mike Lang. <laughs> <laughs> nice well here is the a second version of olio on the this recording and it's uh vic lewis play plays bill holman here we go it's very soft here i don't know how it's there for you Better? No. No, you gotta start over. It's not good. I'm not sure what it what is happening because here Are on you my playing computer. It off YouTube, Kevin? No, no, it's oh. on my computer. Oh no, okay. It's Zoom acts funny sometimes with volume on certain things. It'll it'll grab it or something. So I don't know why it's doing it on this one. It's just markedly lower than the last track. Yeah. yeah. That, Let's say if you can't bring it up, we should move on to something else because it's too nah, soft. Okay. Yeah. Let me let me try it once more. Sure. One more time. Because now I'm both on uh, my media player and on my laptop on full volume. So let's okay. see what happens. No, still pretty low. Yeah, I'm I'm here uh, all maxed out. Well, maybe we just move on to something else. Okay. Uh, that was a nice taste, though. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, you can. Uh, we'll save that for. Everybody. Yeah, let's... but that that's a record, everybody, that you can actually find on YouTube or on on uh, Spotify as well. Yeah. If, uh, if you're interested, Vic Lewis plays Bill Holman. Uh, with a star-studded uh, cast. I All hope right. that the rest of the tracks will be just fine because I don't know what... Uh... Oh, and some folks are chatting that it's loud here and sounds great over here. So ah. volume's hmm. good for people listening. That's interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Two or plus years on Zoom, you think we know how to do this by now. We're still <laughs> we're still learning how to use this stuff. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the worst. I used to be technologically really proficient with synthesizers and these huge racks of MIDI equipment that went from studio to studio. And when I finally saw that that was coming to a, an end and kind of phased it out in my life, I, I'm an idiot with computer stuff. I mean, just basic, you know, stuff. And uh, I'm embarrassed about it, but so I, <laughs> I get it. Yeah. Well, you have so many talents elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My goodness. Yeah. Tom Rainier kind of talked a little bit about that on one of our episodes about the synthesizers coming into the scoring sessions and right. how he quickly had to adapt and get the latest stuff and it was changing so quickly. Did you find that a, a, a easy transition, Mike, or natural? Well, I kind of came to it before it became part of my professional life in a sense yeah i was all i was always interested in electronic keyboards and there was a guy named paul bieber who was the go-to guy to get the earliest kind of generation of electronic instruments and he rented uh, the, the instruments he was trained as a pipe organist so he had very limited kind of uh keyboard abilities, but he had the instruments and he had things like a Nova chord and a Chamberlain. And he was the first guy to own a ballroom electronic harpsichord. And uh, he had some organs and, um, and he uh, got me involved in a lot of recording projects with those instruments. And then when the ARP 2600 came out, um, I invested in one and, and was really interested in it. And it's a very primitive instrument. You can only play one voice at a time. It's a monophonic instrument, um, but it had all of the classic elements of analog synthesis. And um, it required a lot of programming knowledge. And I remember having a very embarrassing moment where at one point I thought, you know, if I don't take this to a recording job, I'll never get past a certain point. 
So there was a wonderful composer arranger named George Tipton who had a weekly TV show. And it was usually piano and strings and woodwinds and it was that kind of a thing. And I just said, hey, George, if you're ever interested, I have this instrument, it's a synthesizer and it does a lot of unusual sounds. He says, yeah, bring it on the next one, we'll use it, you know. And so um, we did a bunch of cues with the piano and then he said, okay, Mike, let's try this one on the synth. And it was a simple melodic line. And um, he said, it should be something kind of pretty, but just a little unsettling. So I came up with whatever I came up with and he liked it and he said, um, he said, it's close. I need you to get a little bit more bizarre with the whole thing. And that, and that went beyond my, you know, very um, rudimentary knowledge of the, of the instrument. So I was now in trouble. And George had a very droll sense of humor because I, and I finally said, George, I'm not sure if I can do that for you right now. And he turned away from me and he faced the uh, string section. He said, ladies and gentlemen, what we have here today is a musician who doesn't know his instrument. And I just like this, destroyed. And he meant it to be ironic and funny. He really wasn't being me. But I uh, retired from the ARP 2600 as a professional tool. And then <clears throat> when polyphonic synthesis started happening and the Jupiter 8 came out with Roland, that was an instrument that I loved and felt really comfortable with. It had memory, you could program and save things and do things way beyond what the, the ARP 2600 did. And so, Slowly but surely, I started accumulating and putting together with MIDI, which was a way for all these instruments to c communicate with each other, uh, a very large, complex um, kind of synthesized orchestra that, that, that I worked with. And then I was also, even before all of that, I you know became uh, comfortable with learning the harpsichord, with learning Hammond organ, with learning you know all the other electronic keyboard instruments. Mm. Learning Celeste, all the different things that, that that were a part of what the work I was doing involved. Mm. That's great. So, and I, I seem to have an aptitude for it. I like I, I liked it. it was fun. Right. Awesome. Yeah, Thanks cool. for sharing. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, Kevin, did you want to replace that track with something else? Or yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, well, I'm hoping that uh, the rest of the stuff uh, will work out good, at least also on our side. Yeah. Um, so was, the, was the Vic Lewis track coming from a different kind of sound source than the Art Pepper track? Nope. No, I, it's on my, uh, it's coming off of my computer. It's an MP3. So yeah. I don't know, I don't know exactly what, what happened with that one. Okay. But, just, uh, yeah. but we can, uh, uh, we can play another really nice session that's kind of in that same vein uh, with uh, uh, West Coast people. The, the session that you did uh, with uh, Teresa Brewer, um, with um, uh, all uh, Ellington uh, record or Ellington songs. Um, and let's see, you recorded that with Shelly Mann, Benny Carter, Oscar Brashear, and Chuck DeMonaco uh, on bass. And it's a really, really incredible band. And, and you said that there was a story behind this, that it was billed as Teresa Brewer and Shelly Mann, but it was kind of a put together thing. No, what I said about the band being booked as Shelly Mann and his men, that was sort of an artificial title that they used for the band. They right. In Shelly Mann's group. This was just a hand-picked group of all-stars, really. Nice. Many yeah. Carter never played in Shelly Mann's band. And yeah. I did on occasion, but that wasn't what we were doing. Right. So, and Oscar Brashear. So, I mean, it was just an all-star band. No, yeah. the, whole, the whole idea was to do, essentially, some of the great Ellington tunes, primarily ballads, uh, with a, a, a good jazz quintet. And it was not commercialized in any way. It was Teresa Brewer doing a jazz album of ballads. And uh, I, was, I, 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 I was very taken with her singing and the way the band played. I thought it was one of the best records I ever had the honor to work with. Wow. Well, let's definitely t uh, take a listen to uh, this track. This is uh, Teresa Brewer with uh, Shelly Mann, Mike Lang, Chuck DeMonaco, Benny Carter, and Oscar Brashear. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, you're taking a solo also on this, Mike, and Benny Carter definitely takes a saxophone solo on this. This is a sophisticated lady. And if there's anything wrong with the, the track, just, you know, uh, let me know if it's- uh, well, We'll be sending you a letter. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Josh, Josh, I bought these poison pens and we, you know, we have them too. You know, so. All right. And people Ooh. watching are saying they're hearing it. So can you let us know, everyone at home, uh, if there's an issue too? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Oh, uh, Craig says something. Under Zoom yeah. audio setting, turn off automatically adjust volume. Yeah. Let Mine's see. off usually, but that can pull the volume down sometimes right. is there any yeah. setting uh that i should adjust at my end no i think no, it, you're okay, okay i think i mean the video's on the the audio's on for me yeah. i'm in the share screen mode i think it's just all yeah so. yeah okay yeah, you're good all right yeah let's see if i can change anything uh on the settings over here real quick doesn't seem like it Hold on, settings. Uh, I'll probably have to go over to, ah, here we go. Uh, thanks, Craig, for that tip. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Zoom tips with Craig. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Audio Zoom settings, here we go. Uh, it's like go. halfway down. Halfway down. Under the advanced? Uh, no. no, it's okay. just, you know, it just says, Automatically adjust microphone volume. It just shouldn't be checked. Shouldn't be checked. Should not be checked. Yeah, should not be checked. Right. Ah, here we, uh, microphone volume. Automatically adjust microphone. Uh, mm, that should be, no. yeah. Uncheck it if it's checked. Okay. Yeah. But it's the microphone, so that's my talk, my talk microphone. But I'll well, just it might also it. be the sound output, too. Yep. Yeah. You yeah, know, that might be the. I'm not sure, but give it a shot. Try this track and see what happens. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this should be good. Okay. Fingers crossed. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Sophisticated Lady by Teresa Brewer. Thank you. 
Nice full oh. instrumental tune on a, on a, a record of a vocalist. That's nice. Yeah, I'd forgotten that we had done that without the vocal. For yeah, yeah. So I, just, I haven't heard that track in decades. It's really nice to hear. Yeah, yeah. And Benny he is so good. He is so... I mean, he was in the 60s. Uh, when we did that. Yeah, he's such an underrated uh, saxophone player and composer. Mm -hmm. His stuff is just incredible. That's that beautiful. Yeah. Really lovely. I love your comping too, Mike, on that. Oh, thank you. So tasteful and just just so supportive, but just, I, I love comping. I mean, yeah. I just, I like listening to it. I like doing it. So I, I really appreciate what you were doing on that. Track. Well, it's, it's really nice to hear that because it's something that I'm always wondering about. You know, it's like, I think it's okay, but I'm not always sure, you know, because again, <laughs> I'm hearing it. And I remember having played it, so it feels larger than life when it probably isn't. So it's probably okay, but I've said, oh, that, what? I played, got in the way. I did this. I, you know, what did I do that for? But it, it seems to be okay. So thank you. you yeah. Get Courage. Oh, it's, it's more than okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, is it, what is it? Oh, go ahead. What is it that you listen for, having said that about you know, you're comping, but what is it that you specifically listen for? Or what do you expect from maybe from other musicians? Or maybe you don't have any expectations, but what is it exactly that you're listening for when you're comping yourself? You mean while I'm playing, what am I listening for? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just, I'm part of something that's an ongoing group effort and it's just finding a place to be. Mm. Um, Sometimes it's a dialogue and sometimes it's definitely accompanimental and not a dialogue. Um, one of the things I really do like to do is when I'm playing for a singer and it's appropriate is to be able to be in a commentary kind of place uh, with a singer so that I can actually react to what they're doing as opposed to just being, you know, a carpet, so to speak. Mm. You know, and there are times when you want to be this thing where you're felt and not particularly heard. Um, it's not an intellectual process for me. I'm in articulating it. I make it sound as if it's a thoughtful process. But honestly, when things are really working as they should, it's it, 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 it's just completely an emotional place to be. And I, I always like to feel that the music is coming from some place that I can't identify and I'm sort of a vessel and it's passing through me and my job is to stay out of the way. Oh, it's like I'm not good. really creating it. I'm just allowing yeah. it to, to, to go forward. And it's a bit mysterious and a bit spiritual. Um, but I think the things that happen that I'm most satisfied with happen in that way. And when they happen with more artificial things in place, like you're trying really hard to make something happen, right. generally what happens with me is I become the impediment rather than the, the helping person. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful thought. Yeah, that's very deep. <laughs> but it sounds like a lot of words, but when it's happening, it's completely nonverbal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's, that's beautifully said. Thank you for that insight. Yeah. Sure. Um, you were mentioning this track that you were that you wrote, and you were talking about the the more the keyboards and the synth type of stuff. Um, and uh, could you tell a little bit about this uh, the track that you wrote, "Rural Still Life Number no. Twenty Six with Tom Scott? It's a yes. little bit of a different vibe to it, but I thought it's it's nice to go to a little bit of a different type of style. Yeah, well, the song in and of itself is, uh, it's its own thing. It's not like the whole record is in the style of this particular track. Yeah. But it, 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 it um, just sort of found itself. What happened was um, Tom had signed with Impulse. He had done one recording for them, which was kind of in a big band with chorus. I think it was kind sound of a commercial jazz record. Ian Freeburn Smith, I think, did the writing. And so this was going to be Tom's jazz record with a quartet and it was going to be more pure um and the band was it was a wonderful band which chuck de monaco and john garen and myself and tom and um tom called me up and he asked me if i'd write a tune and um and he said he wanted it to be kind of funky and kind of uh, homegrown 
So uh, I got this idea of writing something and it, it turned out to be in, in seven meter, you know, seven, four, seven, eight. And it, it had a, a, on the basic track, it had a clavinet with a wah-wah pedal, which was a little bit extreme for a jazz record, but not so much for the, 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 the kind of groove that I was looking for. Mm. And, um, and the tune is very, um, very street. You know, it's ba da 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 so it's that kind of thing. And um, so I had this idea to um, title it like a painting because, you know, so many people, uh, they do things called still lives. It's still life. So, yeah. you know, Picasso did still life number 42 and, and on and on and on and on. So I kind of in a tongue in cheek way, I decided to call my tune Rural Still Life number 26. The, the, the tongue in cheek part was it was the only one I'd ever written and I made it number 26. Yeah. Number one. So um, uh, there's a couple things to say about it. Well, one, one is the way that the track went down, and you'll hear it, is that I'm using the clavinet on the tune itself, but I played a, a piano solo in the middle. So that was sort of a somewhat novel thing to do way back then. And then the other thing that happened that was really odd was that Bob Thiel, who produced this record, wanted to call the album Rural Still Life. So he arranged for us to do photo uh, photography for the album in a, in, a, in, a, in a ranch. So we went out to this location that was owned by a guy named Johnny Splawn or something like that. And he had a ranch that he rented out to film companies for Western movies. So there was like this barn and we we're in front of it and, you know, and we're dressed a little kind of colorfully and they shot this thing. And so that was the rural still life album cover. But the thing that happened after all of that was so amazing was that that location uh, be, be, became the, um, oh God, Charlie Manson uh, place. Whoa, the murders were done. I mean, they, were, they weren't done there, but that's where he lived with those women and that's where all that stuff happened. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it was just an odd kind of thing that, that came after the album, you know. Wow. It had nothing to do with my song. Nothing oh, yeah. Nothing yeah, to yeah. Nothing to do with the wah, wah pedal, you know, nothing. But the timing of, the, of that, because this is what, 1968? I, I'm so? not sure of the date. Do you have Yeah, it? and then Manson's just right around then. So that wow. was 68. It, that's very early, yeah. Yeah. One of the first albums, because I think I did the Jazz Suite in 67. And then yeah. they called me to do the Montreux uh, uh, Jazz Festival. Uh, not Montreux, um, I'm sorry, uh, in California. Montreal, I mean Monterey. Monterey. <laughs> and, Montreal. And, and, and so I did that, and then he asked me to do the album, and we did some gigs along the way, you know. Yeah. And I will, I will say this. Uh, I really recommend anybody who can find this album to listen to the rest of it, because it's one of the best albums Tom did. He, the other tracks are all in different styles. And he, he wrote a tune called Song Number One, where he multi-tracked a lot of different woodwind instruments and wrote this beautiful arrangement, almost like a Gil evans -y kind of thing, really uh, imaginative harmonic thinking and stuff like that. And I remember yeah. he did a ballad treatment of Body and Soul that was cool. And he wrote a tune uh, that was dedicated to John Coltrane called With Respect to John Coltrane, which was a modal kind of, you know, it was kind of the piano part was kind of like a McCoy Tyner yeah. tune. So, I mean, everything about that album was Tom is doing a real music album, you know, mm. it's not commercial in that sense. Yeah. And Josh was right about it because it's uh, from, I looked it up on your Discogs and it's 68 when, uh -huh. this, uh, when this record came out. Yeah. I so, love this album. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's great. I totally agree with you, Mike. It's a really creative effort from Tom. Um, I got to play a little bit with Tom on the road. Um, uh -huh. oh, I brought this one up to him, but I was, of course, more interested as, in his father, Nathan Scott, who was a TV and film composer. Yeah, I got to work with Nathan. Did you work with Nathan? I did, oh, yeah. Wow. He did a show called Lassie, which was a big TV that show. That was his big... Oh, yeah, yeah Lassie. Yeah, of course you worked with him, Mike. Yeah. No, <laughs> that was pretty much on the... The, the fringes of me just getting started, you know, really? I looked into that one. Wow. There were a few old timers that I caught them, you know, at the very end of their careers. That's and, cool, and though. You did. Fun. And uh, and he was great. He's a really good musician. Wow. Yeah. Orchestrator. Fascinating. Hmm. And, and, and Tom, I mean, what a thrill to do anything with him. You know, oh, said, I agree. Yeah. Brilliant. 
And did you mention that on this particular track, it's Abe Laboreal and Jeff Picaro? Am I correct? No, it's Chuck DeMonaco and it's John Gary. Gary. Yeah, Johnny. Oh, okay. They're the Great. rhythm section on this record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, that's definitely- I think Abe was still eating beans in Mexico in 68. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's funny uh let's give it a listen it's a pre it's a pretty short track so here is uh rural still life number 26 tom scott with mike lay Very cool, Mike. Yeah. yeah, that's an awesome solo. There's so much, what you say, like dirt in that in that solo, and also in the track, and just you know, Garen is grooving, not doing anything, you know, very uh, very flashy or or tricky or whatnot. Just you know, staying on that groove for the entire track. It, it's really really good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 
Would you say that your time, Mike, with, with Don Ellis inspired a, a, a track like this because of its odd meter? Um, I would like to, but I worked with Tom before I worked with Don Ellis. Uh -huh. I, I, I really, um, you know, the, it's so odd. I never really had any particular love affair with, with odd time signatures. It was just another thing. Yeah. It wasn't, I embraced it the same way I embraced anything. It was just right. part of it. And, but the odd part was that repeatedly I got hired to play in bands that played in those meters. And so it started with Paul Horn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because his book was mostly originals in five four and seven four. Okay, and then and then uh, with Tom, maybe I was doing a little bit with Don Ellis. Around. It was certainly around the same time when I did Indian Lady and Yeah, uh, Electric Bath. Yeah, Electric, which was on the Electric Bath album, which right. was the, the one album where I did the whole uh, whole album, and I thought it was a really good album. And, it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Absolutely. But altogether, I didn't do like a tremendous amount of stuff with Don. I He asked me to be in the band when I was already freelancing in L.A. and I wasn't really available to go on tour, which I clarified with him. And uh, at the time, he wasn't doing that much touring. So I was able to do the things that he had, you know, which involved some recording and some gigs. And then he started doing some touring. And it was at that point that, that I helped him get another pianist. Mm -hmm. So... Cool. I mean, uh, the next, uh, the we should definitely show something uh, also of the uh, trio stuff that you did uh, several years ago. But there was one question that popped into my mind, which also relates to the next uh, track of uh, Glenn, Gary Glenn Ross, uh, which is a movie soundtrack you did for uh, James Newton Howard. Um, how does one become a piano player who works with every major film composer in the business because you worked with John Williams, Jerry Goldsmith, Lalo, uh, Henry Mancini. How is that something that you just rolled into or do you think that you need a particular set of skills to get into that niche? How, how did that happen for you? Well, I'm not sure I know how to answer that except to say um, it does require it, it depends who you are and what you're being asked to do. Uh -huh. In my case, I was a generation of keyboard players who was more diverse than the people who preceded me. Mm. And I found that out through self-discovery just as much as anybody else did. You know, when I first started doing dates, it was primarily to play piano. And I thought of myself as sort of being uh, attached to classical music as used in a film and attached to jazz music as used in a film. But then early on, I was working with Phil Spector and people that were in pop music. And um, I didn't actually have a lot of knowledge about pop music. I knew a lot about R&B music. It was part of my childhood. So even though I didn't play it as a kid, I had an affinity for it. And when I got asked to do things that were in that world, I really realized how much I liked playing that music. The pop thing just sort of came. And, um, but I just, I realized that I, I get stimulated by fresh things and I get stimulated by doing new things. And I also get stimulated by solving problems. Mm -hmm. So for me, my way of looking at the work that was coming my way is to go into a job and try and identify what my role was and what it was I needed to figure out to produce what was being asked of me. And as time went on, I found out that there was a wide variety of things that would be, you know, showing up for me. So then I started realizing I'm being hired partially because I'm diverse, because whereas in the past you might have had to hire two different keyboard players to cover some diversity, uh, in many cases now you could hire one keyboard player and they could be the orchestral pianist and they could play the source music that might involve jazz or pop music or whatever, and it would be the same person. So that was a new place to be in, in, in recording world. So, um, so yes, there's in, in answer to the skill set, it, it kind of identified itself as it went. And I, and I also think that um, as people discovered what they might ask me to do, it, that enlarged what they might ask me to do. So in a sense, I might have been the genesis for something that I was asked to do rather than that they're calling me for what they want me to do. They're saying, oh, I got Mike Lang. Can he do this or can he do that? So it became kind of a, an organic thing that had its own, it, 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 its own energy. Mm. But um, I think um, 
I mean, the thing that was different for me was that I wasn't sitting in an orchestra playing violin or playing a woodwind part or playing, you know, a written percussion part and going home. I was sitting on many dates. I did do that. I did many dates where I was playing orchestral piano for film composers, and that's all I would do. But there were so many other dates with it that were more about doing different things. So um, I, 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 I think... Um, Sounds a little silly, but I think my profession found me as I found it. Mm. You know, it's just like a chemistry took place. It was kind of ongoing because uh, the industry was changing and it's always changing. And so you're a part of that thing that's going on where what you did in maybe 1968, you're doing something else in 1972. And part of the reason you're doing it is that you're a part of it. Mm. Yeah. Again, well said. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Just yeah, love I wrote all the stuff out last night. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Including the jokes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, but it's interesting because when you ask a question, it provokes me to think about it in real time sure. right now to, to, to find the answer. You know, uh, is it, that's kind of, I get the feeling also that's kind of how you go about that with your music. Like you have a question. And it makes you think, so you start to play, and you start to find your your role in it, and uh, to make the music in the best way of your capabilities, basically. Sure. Yeah. 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 That's that's really really cool Good way to put it. Um, yeah. Let's let's listen because we don't have that much time uh, left, but it would be cool to show this track, the soundtrack of Glenn Gary, Glenn uh, Glenn Ross. Uh, it features uh, yourself, Mike Lang, uh, John Patitucci, Jeff Percaro, Wayne Shorter is also on this track, and Lenny Castro also plays percussion on this track. So Oof. let's listen to Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Uh, by and James for those Gary who haven't Park. seen the film, it's a great movie. You know, ah, David Lemon. Yeah. Or Brew. It's great. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jack Lemon, Alec Baldwin, Al Pacino. Yeah. That's wow. Right. Oh, okay. I definitely have to watch this. It's a good one. I haven't seen it. Yeah. And, and, and I have a story. Maybe I should tell it before you play it. Yeah. Sure. Um, Please. James, uh, I had worked with James on a bunch of different scores. And um, and he called me and he said, um, I'm writing a score and um, I'm a little bit in foreign land for myself because it's, it, it, it's going to be jazz oriented. And I have Wayne Shorter involved in it. And um, and he, he said, I wrote a main title and can I send it to you? And can you just tell me what you think of how it is? And I, and I said, yeah, I'm not sure what you're looking for from me, but I'll, I'll do whatever I can. So he sent a cassette just to let you know how long ago it was. <laughs> and it was, a, it was a demo of a, I can't remember how he did it. I think it was all done in his home studio, but it was basically a jazz quartet kind of with percussion and, um, I think what he wanted to know was whether he was writing this music so it sounded convincingly to be whatever it was. And what it struck me to be was very much like Weather Report's music in a harmonic way and in a melodic way, but maybe a little more toned down in the sense that it was cinematic. You know, it wasn't, uh, uh, it, was, it, it was evocative. It had a, a vibe to it. So, so, so I, I, I called him and I said, um, it reminds me of, of some of the music that Joe Zawinul and Wayne Shorter have done on their own. It seems a little bit more um, laid back. Uh, it, it strikes me as being cinematic. Uh, I like it. I think the melody is memorable and, 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 and affecting. And, uh, and I also don't know what the fuck I, sorry, I shouldn't use that word. Uh, <laughs> Go I, ahead. I don't, I, I don't know what, I don't know what to share with you that's going to be helpful. My job here is to try and say something that's useful. So, <laughs> so I think I think it's really nice as a piece of music, and if it's the right thing for the director and the right thing for the film, I I don't see anything to 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 say other than the congratulations, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and so that was the beginning of it. And then when we uh, we got to the studio, it was pretty much that and, and, and some other cues he had written. And I, I kept pinching myself to see if I was really in a studio with Wayne Shorter. I mean, it was just such an honor and such a, a special moment for me uh, to get to meet him and to get to, to get to work with him. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the band is 
incredible too. Well, let's uh, give this uh, a listen. Glenn Gary was, was, as I recall, that was Jeff Beccaro, which yeah. you mentioned earlier, and and who was the bass player? Uh, John Petitucci is credited. Right, and you know, ironically, John Petitucci became Wayne Shorter's bass player. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. I met on that on that film. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Who knows? All right. Well, let's get into the music. Here we go. Kevin, I don't I think your sound is not being shared. Oh, my apologies. Yeah, no worries. My apologies. I didn't want to say anything. No, you you're right. Here you go. Sharing That was really soft. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was some really incredible music. <laughs> uh, I just got an email from John Cage. He was thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Second attempt. Cool. Here we go. Thank you. 
That's a nice score. Whew. Yeah. <clears throat> I love your touch just on that. That's it's so great, Mike. Oh, thank you. I haven't heard that in a long time. Yeah. It's very evocative. Yeah. Cool. Reminiscent of another score, James. I'm a James Newton Howard fan, and just a year later, The Fugitive also featured Wayne Shorter, actually. But I don't know. Were you on that score? I was. I don't remember Wayne being on it. I would. I did orchestra dates. I can't remember Wayne being there, but uh, I worked on the on the score. Oh, that's so cool. Andrew, um, yeah. The, the the guy who directed is. Uh, I get emails from him. He's a major jazz aficionado i can't remember his last name he's always sending me stuff to listen to oh yeah. oh really that's yeah. cool it's a powerful film oh i love that movie i think it's great the director is um i'll think of it in a minute but andy I, davis. that's andy davis andy davis okay yeah and i i'm a big brad dector fan as i know you are and oh, yeah. getting to interview him for another thing i did i learned of his incredible you know catalog of what he's worked on and and this movie was one that he worked on as well yes, uh, he, the, the fugitive that is yeah he he he, he did apply quite, quite a bit of work with james right period of time and yeah uh, he wrote a piano concerto for me so i was happy with that yeah i was reading about that i'd love to hear it was it recorded in, in a very poor live fashion he's got something that's um, not releasable or anything oh. but, you can hear the notes we played. It's, I'd love to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's really cool. Hey, um, maybe it's a, a good point to go to one of those YouTube links that you actually sent uh, over, Mike, with uh, your trio performances, because that is a very important moment in your musical career. You mentioned um, playing together with Jim Keltner and Mike Valerio as kind of. Uh, a culmination of everything that you've done in in your career but that was the moment that you did something under your own name correct yes it was my concert it took place uh, in the summer of 2019 and uh, there's an organization called piano spheres which does concerts of of contemporary classical piano music it was founded by leonard stein who we spoke of earlier mm -hmm. yeah who, who was uh one of the main people associated with Arnold Schoenberg when he was living and, and teaching in Los Angeles. And Leonard was a pianist and he had four students and the five of them uh, came together to form a group called Piano Spheres that would do five recitals over a, a season. And, and it was all 20th century piano music and it started with Schoenberg and Berg and Weber and Stravinsky and people like that. And then move forward to people like Schockhausen and Boulez and then they were commissioning pieces. And for close to 30 years, they've been an entity. And, um, and Leonard is gone, but the four pianists who, who, who started it are, they're, well, they're switching things now, but they've been involved through most of it. And uh, Heidi Lazeman, who's the executive uh, director of it, called me and said that they wanted to inaugurate a jazz series of piano spheres. And would I do their, 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 their first concert? And I was initially kind of intimidated at the whole idea. Um, my performing as a jazz musician has been mostly playing with other people. And I finally got the courage to go to Catalina's with my own trio over a period of about, uh, I don't know, three or four years. I did maybe five or six gigs, uh, many of them with Mike Valerio and Jim Keltner. And I did some stuff with um, Abraham Laboreal and Walter Rodriguez, a couple of different rhythm sections. and. Um, so when I, you know, the, I think the reason I felt comfortable in saying yes was that two years prior to this concert, Roger Kellaway called me and he was doing a, du a, a two piano uh, evening of a big piece he had written. It was a, a ballet kind of, of Paul McCartney's music. So it was gonna be two pianos in a rhythm section and this was being done at Zipper Hall also. And this was for the Jazz Bakery. And so uh, I said yes to that. And it was Roger and myself and Derek Oles and, and Peter Erskine. Oh, and, wow. uh, and it was a challenge and a great evening in many, many ways. And I think because I was able to sort of have the courage to do that, uh, I called back and finally said, yes, I, I'm, I'll do it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and committed to it. And then I decided that um, it should be kind of autobiographical in terms of 
you know, I, I learned when I played at Catalina's that I actually like talking to audiences and I like bonding with them. And it came naturally. I never thought it would, but it seems to be a big, big part of what I like to see happen when I'm playing. And um, so this evening, it started, it started off with a very abstract, almost like a 20th century classical improvisation. And I did that to kind of, kind of, appeal to part of the audience that I knew was not going to be there as a jazz audience. It was going to be there because there's piano spheres and they're used to hearing Stockhausen. So what do I play that kind of will keep them from walking out of the concert, you know? <laughs> so, so I started with that thing and then, um, and then we did stuff with the trio. I did solo stuff and the material was either a great American songbook or I had picked jazz originals by, by, by important, jazz uh, artists like Herbie Hancock, people like that. And then I did some of my own music and I also did some things where I was working with film composers on jazz related material and told the stories about what that was. So I'd done some, I, I did some music of Mancini and Jerry Goldsmith. And so, mm. and it was a kind of just the story of all the different kinds of stuff that I like to do. And, and I just, it, it was fun, it was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I've survived. Yeah, I, I bet that it's a little bit more than just surviving. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's uh, let's take a look at because uh, I'll I'll share the screen for this uh, as well. Um, here we go. Share screen. I was very lucky because Zipper Hall is arguably one of the best acoustic uh, venues in Los Angeles as a mid-sized mid venue. And they have an audio visual team that works there that mm -hmm. is as good as you could ever hope to have. So at the end of all of this, I ended up with a stereo mix. I ended up with a Pro Tools mix. I oh, ended wow. up with multi-camera video. And so two years later, when the pandemic had curtailed piano spheres from doing any more concerts, they asked me if I would go through the video and try and put it into a streaming format that would be something they could use to fill the gap. And so that's that's what you have. You have these mm. two, it, it was about a two hour concert, amazingly. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, so there, 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 there are two segments to the concert. They got flushed out uh, with video editing and I added some additional footage to make it a little more uh, um, varied. There's some yeah. stuff. Yeah, I believe this is the first, uh, first tune of the concert. So why don't we take a... Uh, look at uh, your trailer. Well, if you uh, want to hear, I mean, if you're going to play the first tune of the concert, you're going to hear something that is pretty far removed from the trio and the jazz stuff that they did. It's okay if that's what you want to play. But whatever you song, want. It's a, solo, it's a solo piano piece. It's very abstract and very contemporary. And I, I don't mind if you play it. I, I would encourage if you have time, you might want to play one other thing from the concert to show a little bit more about what happened that there. Yeah, I think this should be this should be a trio tune because I'm I'm scrolling through the fr the frames right now and you seem to be playing with the, with the trio. So oh, I'm okay. not. Then you move I, forward. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if needed, I'll just scroll a little bit uh, uh, for it. But I'll do the full screen for you guys. So here we go. Uh, Mike okay. Lang, Michael Valerio, and Jim Keltner. Dolphin dance. That, that sounds very soft. I don't know how it is for you guys. It we can hear it, but it is soft. Yeah. Can you make it louder? Yeah. That's the loudest. Maybe just increase your volume on your computer mic. That's what I'm doing. You know? I can hear it. Yeah. I think this is dolphin gas.
love that. Mm. Hey, Mike. Yeah, Mike. Thank you. Wow. I play the melody that the way out when you do the da 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 da. <laughs> I do the same thing right there, man. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Mm. Pianists think alike sometimes, don't we? Yeah. Why? Uh, why did you pick uh, Valerio and Keltner for for this to be with you in the rhythm section? Um, well, I've been working with them uh, at at uh, um, Catalina's and. Uh, Mike is arguably the most versatile bass player I know on the planet. Uh, here, here. Yeah. And Keltner, I've known him forever, and I love him because he'll always do something unexpected. Yeah. He'll, yeah. Always, he'll always throw, it's like he, um, he's combustible or something. It was just, um, <laughs> I wanted a wild card, you know, and he was very shy about wanting to do it because he said, you know, I never play jazz anymore because he started off playing jazz and then he got very involved in pop music became yeah. a celebrity of it and um but he's just so imaginative um and um and there were, there were times when it was maybe a little left of whatever but uh i dig it yeah i i i and i like the chemistry between them they enjoyed each other yeah it was a nice um casting moment yeah that's yeah. awesome for, for everybody who's watching, uh, you can find this on uh, uh, YouTube if you just uh, look up uh, Mike Lang, This Moment in Time. You can find uh, part one and part two of uh, this beautiful concert live at Zipper Hall. Um, unfortunately, we have to wrap things, uh, things up, but uh, Mike, this has been so cool to talk to you about your own career because you know we've done the, the first interview with you about Larry Bunker which was awesome as well but we wanted to have you on the show already for quite some time so it's it's really an honor and and, and a, a pleasure to uh, talk with you and as I told you over the phone we always are able to uh, hit on you know the the tip of the iceberg of you know this immense career that you that you have uh, but thank you nonetheless for uh, oh it, it's my here. pleasure and uh, it was wonderful to do the interview and to revisit some of these moments some of which I haven't seen in, 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 a, in a long time you know um, it's fun so thank yeah. you so much and yeah. I, I hope your audience uh, had a good time I think so we had a bunch of really uh, really cool people uh, our uh, our regulars uh, but uh, Larry Goldings was also uh, uh watching and uh, they were definitely digging what we were playing and what you oh, were saying as well. well he's he's one of my favorite musicians when he's not yeah. being hans griner I, <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. I like it when he's hans griner too yeah, well, yeah. Groner, i guess it is okay. um yeah yeah i had no uh window to see any of the people who were online for whatever reason i could only see the two of you yeah that's that's the thing with zoom uh that you can't see the the, the chat that's only uh, when you're doing something in Zoom, then there is a chat option. But there, uh, Liz Finch was there, Larry Goldings was there, um, Josh, some other people. Jim Fox. Saw. Jim Fox is watching. Oh, nice. Jim Fox? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, there should be a way for me to see that when you guys are doing it. You might want to look into how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, there's uh, the, the Facebook. Uh, when you just go on onto the internet, uh, how we do it, we just open up Facebook and we mute the Facebook uh, feed so that you can see it. But you can also watch it back and you'll see all of the responses also. Right. right? No, I understand. I mean, but in process, when I'm, I have to do it with the Zoom link to be here. Oh, right. Right. And I can't see it and I should be able to. There's a way to do it. I have oh, both okay. Zoom and Facebook open at the same time, Mike. Oh, well. That's how I can see it. Yeah. You didn't tell me about that. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Can we do it again? I just, yeah. Let's you know. start over. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, that'll just leave the door open for part two because, like Kevin said, we barely scratched the surface. If you'll come back and talk with oh, us yeah. more, yeah, I, I, I'll come back and we can do all my gigs in in seven eight. No. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Know, I'd be happy yeah. to come back anytime. It was totally oh, thank you, Mike. Thanks for sharing your stories and, and just some of the nuggets of wisdom that you dropped on yeah. us. This beautiful. Absolutely. So, thank you for that. Of course. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Until, until next time.
Yeah, and uh, for everybody else out there, uh, we're going to be back on May 10th with the great Terry Gibbs. Terry Gibbs is going to be back uh, for uh, celebrating uh, the LA Jazz Institute uh, tribute weekend in his honor. And on May 14th, the West Coast Jazz Hour Quintet will be at Sam First with special guest Bill Cunliffe on piano, Katie Thoreau, Clay Jenkins, and Brian Clancy. And then on June 9th, the big band will be back at Vibrato. So those are the current dates that we have in the books. Awesome. So that's great. Now yeah. everybody is also up to date on what we're doing in the future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thanks again, Mike. Thanks again uh, for everybody who's watching and we'll see everybody next time. Okay. Bye everybody. Thank Bye, you. Bye everybody. Take Thank care. you, Mike. Bye. Thank you.